Good afternoon and welcome to Fortress Press Live, where we connect you with the people and passions behind the books we publish here at Fortress Press. Our guest today is Peter Sandlin, and we'll be talking about his book, Augustine's Theology of Preaching. Peter, thanks for being a part of today's episode of Fortress Press Live. Thank you very much, Sean. I'm delighted to take some time and chat with you and your audience. Well, if you would, take a few minutes and introduce yourself to the Fortress Press Live audience and tell us about the work you're doing over there, as, as we like to say, across the pond. Thanks, Sean. Well, uh, yeah, my name is Peter Sanlon, and I am a minister in the Church of England. Uh, that's my full-time job, so I do all of the normal things that church ministers do. Today, I've been speaking to people about their upcoming wedding. I've been uh, praying with a man who's, whose wife is very ill. I've been planning next Sunday's church service and sermon, and uh, that's how I spend my time day to day. But in the past, I have also um, lectured at a seminary in systematic theology and church history. And uh, I have a PhD from Cambridge in uh, systematic theology and church history. And that means that there is another side to my ministry as well. There's the normal pastoral preaching. Um, I do occasional speaking engagements for seminaries and training courses. And I'm involved in writing various books and articles that are hopefully of use to people in seminaries or in the ministry. And today we're talking about your new book, which is called Augustine's Theology of Preaching. Now, I know every book has its own unique backstory, so I'd be curious to hear a bit of the uh, story behind how this book got its start. Sure. Well, uh, back in about the year 2000, I was, uh, just as, as a Christian in church, becoming increasingly concerned that I was understanding the Bible, I thought, well, and being taught the Bible accurately. but But my own personal passion for God and my sense that he was emotionally connected to me was somewhat lacking. So I began looking around on the internet to try to find books that might begin to help minister to that problem, which I I gather is a problem that many, many Christians in various sections of the church experience. And I settled on the great American theologian, Jonathan Edwards, really, as the person who I felt gave the answers to the, the problems I was feeling. Uh, his great book, The Religious Affections. And then having read that, I read many other volumes of his collected works published very ably by Yale University Press. And um, that I, I wanted to pursue that really. So um, as I went forward for ordination in the Church of England, I was asked would I like to, to, to study for a doctorate at Cambridge University as part of that process of ordination training. And I wanted to do a PhD in Jonathan Edwards, to be honest. But as soon as I began to look into it, um, I discovered that uh, mainly American PhD candidates have more than adequately covered almost all of the territory that I was interested in studying to do with Jonathan Edwards. So it just wasn't going to be uh, be suitable um, academically. So I did more research and reading, and I began to come to the view that the the passion for God and the, the connection of people's emotions that Jonathan Edwards understood so well um, actually originated in the history of the church with the great church father, St. Augustine. So that put me along the trajectory of looking into Augustine. And uh, as I began reading through his works, reading the scholarly literature, I came across a little comment in one of the academic handbooks that just dismissed Augustine's sermons. And it just made me think, I wonder about this great theologian's sermons. Are they, are, are they of some value? And I began to look into that and settled on the idea of doing a PhD on Augustine's theology of preaching. So that's how it came about. And this book is a, an edited, uh, tidied up, amended version of the PhD, which I uh, was awarded a few years ago by Cambridge. Well, and one of the things you talk about in the book is that our understanding of Augustine is somewhat distorted if his preaching is overlooked. Give us some insight in uh, why have scholars tended to shy away from Augustine's preaching and really, how has that impacted our, our current perception of him? Yes, well, I, I, um, I, I, I cite a number of the standard academic handbooks, like the, uh, the, the Cambridge Handbook to Augustine and some others, which um, do indeed make comments that are quite dismissive of the preaching of Augustine. They, they say things like, you know, the, the sermons of Augustine are sort of the uh, less educated, more casual contributions to the history of the church compared to his famous works like Confessions, City of God. And when you look at the 
percentage of publications that are put out about Augustine, uh, you find the vast majority of it is all about two or three of his books, The Confession, City of God, and The Trinity. And the sermons, very, very little output on them. Now, why is that? Well, I, I think that there can be in the academy, uh, regrettably, a, a form of pride. And I think that um, it, is, it is the case sometimes that scholars in the academic world might look down a bit upon the, the preaching pastoral work that church ministers do. And that somehow gets read back into the way they handle the texts from church history. I think that there's also sort of a the nature of academic writing. There's a, a knock on effect that if lots of people are writing about an area, then it's quite easy for other academics to respond to what's gone before. And that that is wonderful because it produces very insightful, uh, detailed investigations of core areas of theology and church history. But it means that as everybody's responding to a debate that's going on in, the, in, in one field or one area of the field, it's harder for new areas to be opened up. And I think there's been a little bit of that has gone on in the last uh, 30 or so years of Augustinian scholarship. You also asked about how that lack of focus on his preaching might have impacted current perceptions of him. Well, I think that the, the most common two perceptions of Augustine today are the stern heresy hunter and also the highly philosophical thinker. And both of those are images which you can see in other parts of his life and work. But if you don't know, or if you sort of forget that alongside doing all of those other things, you know, writing against the Donatists, the Pelagians, um, and so forth, alongside that, Day in, he was preparing sermons. Um, he was pastoring people. He was involved in their daily life. Um, you, you get you get a very truncated view of of Augustine and a very truncated view of his theology. Um, he viewed his sermons as a key contribution to the theological endeavor of the church. He could refer people to them as answers, uh, authoritative answers to theological questions. He expected real Christians to be coming to church, listening to his preaching. And um, yeah, it's a very important part of his life ministry and contribution to the history of the church. Well, it was really interesting as I picked up the book and was looking at it yesterday. I'd never really given much thought to Augustine as a preacher. You know, I often have thought of him as this ivory tower theologian, but but never as a preacher. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm definitely part of the problem, I guess, in that regard. Well, well that, that, you know, what you've just said just just shows that the the sort of output that goes on in the academic world just just filters down into the the general assumptions that people have in the church. And um, I hope that, uh, you know, a book on Augustine's theology of preaching will just encourage people to, you know, maybe go out and buy some of Augustine's sermons. They're, they're published in a beautiful modern English translation by New City Press, um, 10 or 11 volumes. And um, they're edifying, they're insightful, and uh, they're, yeah, they're, they're very, very helpful to people today. Now, as modern readers are approaching Augustine's preaching, well, what are some of the historical and really contextual landmarks that will help us to properly set our bearings as we engage with his work? Yes, it's, it, it's very important to remember that uh, Augustine lived in a, in a different world to the one we live in. Um, you know, when I was exploring doing research on Jonathan Edwards, I, I felt that he he almost lives in our world. You know, when you're reading him in English, uh, New England uh, in his day was different to our, our world, but, but you can see that there's a, quite a close connection. When you translate yourself back to fourth century North Africa under Roman rule, it's a different world. You know, I was reading Augustine's sermons in Latin and um, the way they're all, all quotations are translated in the book. But Fourth century North Africa was under Roman rule, but had its own African sort of vitality still. The Romans who lived in Rome would look down a bit upon those who lived in the sort of North African part of the empire. And people like Augustine, who, who was born in North Africa, would have had that sense of being not quite in the in club. And so as you begin to read the sections in the book, which give you an insight to the world of North Africa under Roman rule, you, you get a sense of a, a man, a man who had huge talent, huge ability, and was desperately striving to make his mark upon the world. 
knowing that his background would always hold him back, but, but he was so talented, he was, he was determined to press forward. And yeah, so there's, there's more I say in the book about the North African culture and the way it impacted his ministry and preaching and the church. But just being aware of that is very important. And secondly, uh, and finally, I think um, it's important to understand that the world Augustine was preaching to was a world which was saturated in hundreds of years of philosophical debate about the nature of communication and rhetoric and oratory. They didn't have televisions. They didn't have Facebook. And uh, when people wanted entertainment, one of the most popular things to do was to listen to somebody give a speech in various settings. And there was all kinds of debates about the role of ethics, uh, the nature of manipulation, the role of the character of the speaker. All of these things were debated with all kinds of schools of thought. And as Augustine comes to preach, he has to engage with all of those issues. He wrote a book on how to preach. And in that, he engages with that issue explicitly. And in his preaching, he is in some ways using the pagan techniques. In other ways, he's setting them aside and relying upon this Holy Spirit and scriptures and God. But that whole debate is a very important background to the nature of Augustine's theology of preaching. And I I take some time to lay that out in the book. Another big focus in the book is where you talk about the hermeneutical keys of interiority and temporality. Uh, I'd be curious if you could give us an example of how you apply those in the book in order to help the reader better understand Augustine's approach to preaching. Of course, yes. I mean, one of one of the goals of the book is to, is to give people some sort of a sense of an experience of listening to Augustine's preaching. You know, we have hundreds of his sermons and, you know, 10 or 11 volumes uh, in English. You know, the average reader is not going to want to read through all of those sermons. So my goal was to give you a bit of a sense of what was going on when he preached and, and make you feel like you've heard him preaching. And uh, I felt that, that trying to use, um, to suggest a, a couple of keys that explain the nature of what, what he was doing when he was preaching would help guide the reader through a massive body of literature. And my suggestion is that when, when Augustine preached, he was always using uh, and, and defaulting to uh, these ideas of, that I've called interiority and temporality. Um, both actually words that he did use in Latin, but even when the words aren't used, the concepts are constantly relied upon. Interiority is, is that focus on what goes on inside our hearts, the, the desires, the longings, the imagination, the passions that drive us in life. Um, it's a lot to do with the affections, which Jonathan Edwards made famous, but uh, it includes our whole inner world of, of, of ideas and concerns. And temporality is, is the idea of time moving forward, of being aware of the past and being drawn into the future. And in Augustine's preaching, he is always taking the Bible, taking the scripture passage, and seeking to apply it to the interiority of his listeners. Um, he famously said in Confessions, you know, my heart is restless till it takes its rest in you. You know, that focus on the inner heart, the restlessness of the human heart. He wants to pour the Bible and everything that God says in the Bible into the hearts of his listeners and to shape them at that very deep down level. And then at the same time, he's, he's also defaulting to this idea of temporality. So he, um, he is very aware that the Bible is not just a list of doctrinal propositions, it's a story. And he always wants to make use of that story from creation, fall, the history of Israel, Jesus to the new creation. And he wants to draw listeners' hearts into that great story of scripture. And that, I think, often explains the sorts of arguments and the sorts of moves that Augustine makes when he, when he handles the Bible in his preaching. So one little example of how that works out would be the, the issue of martyrdom. Uh, there were many uh, martyrs in the history of the uh, church in North Africa. And uh, oftentimes Augustine would be preaching on that topic and uh, would have a Bible passage that he would find relevant to that and, and use. And one of the questions that he asks in one sermon is, well, we're not under persecution at the moment. Um, the martyrs were the great examples of Christians. You know, how can we possibly follow their example today when there is no state persecution? And his answer is that uh, you can be a martyr if you just die peacefully in your bed at home, trusting in Jesus Christ. 
And what he's really doing there is putting the idea of martyrdom into the interior belief and the interior worldview of the average Christian, saying that uh, you don't need to go out and do anything heroic and spectacular. If quietly in your heart, you're just trusting Jesus as you die, that is, a, that is, that is as good as a martyrdom as uh, those great famous martyrs who were uh, thrown to the lions. And at the same time, in the same sermon, he's very concerned to say to the Christian who dies, you know, there is a future beyond the grave, um, that future world of heaven where we all see God. That is what he holds in front of the Christian who is facing death. So interiority and temporality enable him to make a pastoral twist on the whole idea of martyrdom. And uses, he uses that in his preaching. That's one of many examples that I explore in the book. Well, thanks for that explanation. That's certainly helpful. In your mind, what's the most important takeaway for readers once they finish Augustine's theology of preaching? Preaching is very, very important. Preaching is central to the task of theology, to the nature of church, to the experience of being a Christian in this world. Uh, God has arranged things in such a way that the, the opening up of the Bible in the act of preaching is his method for uh, growing Christians, for transforming the inner lives and the inner worldviews of people. Um, and that is really what I'd love people to, to take away, that um, preaching is, is more important than we assume it is. And um, many Christians and ministers out there, of course, would nod in agreement and say, yes, of course, we know that. But if people then read this book on Augustine's theology of preaching, I think it, it grounds that conviction more deeply. You know, um, the way people seek to open up the Bible today is not actually something that was just invented a few years ago. It's not the product of the modern communication age or the, uh, the Enlightenment or anything like that. It goes right back to one of the greatest church fathers in the fourth century, Augustine. And uh, in that sense, I hope that people who already believe preaching is important would be encouraged to, uh, to give themselves to that task afresh, uh, maybe learn some more ideas that, about, about how to go about the task of preaching, and just be more confident in, in its centrality uh, to God's plan for the church and the world. One last question here as we begin to wrap up. Thinking of both, say, the undergraduate and graduate classroom, uh, what sort of courses do you think might benefit from adding Augustine's Theology of Preaching to their book or reading list? Well, if, if you are um, teaching a class on church history or a class on systematic theology or doctrine, and Augustine does not feature to a significant degree, then I think there's probably something wrong. Um, his, his seminal contribution to the, uh, the Western church means that it's very difficult to teach the Reformation or teach the medieval age or um, teach many core areas of systematic theology without engaging with Augustine. So once Augustine features in the whole curricula for, for, for one of those courses, if his preaching is not used and drawn upon, then the Augustine you're engaging with is, I would say, um, a rather truncated uh, Augustine. It's not, it's not the real Augustine. There are areas in his writings where you know, he talks about the resurrection. And if I was doing a course that included uh, some teaching on the resurrection. Why not, why not go to Augustine's sermons on the resurrection? And uh, rather than just see his philosophical debates about the nature of resurrection from his academic writings, um, I think Augustine himself would want people to be aware of how he preached that to people and how he used it to change their attitudes to, to themselves and to their world. So the final thing I could say about using a book like this in, in, in graduate and undergraduate settings is it, it is an integrative book. We, we have suffered a bit in the world of theological teaching and church history from the, the over-specialization and um, dealing with Augustine's sermons, you're seeing one of the great theologians and leaders of church history engaged in the task of preaching. And in that sense, this book, Augustine's Theology of Preaching, certainly will be useful to um, study on preaching and homiletics. But this is an integrative task. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to break down some of the walls that have been built between systematics, church history, pastoral ministry, and homiletics. So in that sense, it's, it's a call to academic departments, perhaps, to talk to each other and, and work together and to, to build up the church together. And I hope it is of some help in that task. Well, thank you for sharing that. That certainly helps us uh, 
think a bit better about where this book might be used in the classroom. Uh, now, for the listeners who are interested in finding out more about Peter's book, you can take a look at the show notes for this episode, or you can always visit our website and check out the product page, which you'll find at fortresspress.com. And Peter, thanks so much for being generous with your time this morning and for sharing with us today about Augustine's Theology of Preaching. Lovely. Thank you very much for uh, chatting. It was very enjoyable. Thanks for being a part of my conversation today with Peter Sandlin. To view the show notes for this episode or to leave a comment, head over to fplive.fortresspress.com forward slash 006. Every episode of Fortress Press Live is available via iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast distribution platform. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off.